Welcome everyone to today's uh, SPCLB cast. Um, to, we have the great pleasure of uh, having Hieronimo Castrian uh, from TU Dresden here to uh, talk to us. Uh, Hieronimo is a professor uh, and head of the Chair of Compiler Construction at the Department of Computer Science at TU Dresden. Um, he received his uh, electronics engineering degree from the Pontifica Bolivariana University in Colombia, uh, a master's from the Alari Institute in Switzerland, and a PhD uh, from RWTH Aachen. Um, he has also co-founded a uh, company called Selexia, uh, working on programming tools for embedded multi-core architectures, which was uh, is now with Xilinx and hence with um, AMD now. Um, and Hieronimo works on uh, methodologies, languages, tools, algorithms for uh, programming uh, complex uh, and interesting computing systems. And with that, uh, please take it away. Thank you. Okay, hey, awesome. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Nikolai, for the introduction. And also, uh, thanks uh, to Torsten for inviting me. So it's, uh, it's very nice to, to be talking to all of you guys. So um, this presentation has several slides that are shared from a, from a past keynote that I gave last year. So if you, if you attended that keynote, so uh, you, you will see some repetition today. So yeah, okay, so, so this is kind of an overview talk of some of the things that we do in our group and some of the things that um, I'm actually very excited about. Um, so maybe let's let me get into it. So the first slides, I guess um, many of you will, will be familiar with this, right? So the evolution of computing, kind of all these roles that have appeared um, because of the narrow scaling, because of power density constraints, right? The things that led to multi-cores, the, the things that led to heterogeneous systems, it would, like in dark silicon in the 2010s. And um, today I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about like this new kind of architectures, uh, maybe post CMOS technologies, and you see a bunch of keywords there uh, that people are flying around. So yeah, that's what I mean with like heterogeneous systems where when I, when I talk about heterogeneous, I don't not only talk about like, like CPU or GPU, but um, yeah, CPU, GPU, FPGAs, and, but maybe also uh, emerging memory technologies with in-memory capabilities and this kind of stuff, right? So stuff like, what, what you see today in, in commercial things like TPUs or AI engines in silence chips, but also bioinformatics accelerators in 3D stack memories, uh, also novel interconnect what people are doing with silicon photonics uh, so that distributed computing is kind of um, maybe, it uh, becomes more transparent and you, you don't know that things are running distributed because of this new type of in interconnects. Um, and yeah, and as I said, emerging memory technology and in-memory computing is something that we're looking um, quite a quite a bit. So if you have all this, this this kind of systems, and of course the question is how uh, what kind of applications would run in the systems. There is, um, as as you know, there's a lot of traction in like AI chips and, and machine learning like workloads. At least the traditional ones, the deep learning kind of um, algorithms, and that has a lot of that has brought a lot of innovation in hardware. Um, but we want to use these systems for things other than uh, just the machine learning workload. And that's something that I find very interesting. Like if you look at all the applications that, that we have out there, like from, from HPC computing, from um, automotive kind of applications, and of course, ML, how to use this, the systems, um, especially if they were not directly tailored for them, right? Like for instance, in, in cars or in, in, the, in the telecom uh, uh, sector, AI engines are very interesting because they, they can accelerate a lot of single processing um, applications or single processing kernels that are ne not necessarily uh, the traditional like kind of machine learning workloads. Okay, so yeah, so the, the, the thing that um, kind of motivates my research and that what I, what I had in the abstract of this talk is that it's very difficult to deal with this complexity, especially for domain experts, right? People that are maybe not expert programmers. Um, so what I said is that um, this, this golden area, this golden era in computer architecture requires maybe also a golden era in, in the way we design programming methodologies, compilers, languages, abstractions, and, and I put emphasis on toll-free abstractions, right? Those abstractions that are there to increase productivity, but you don't suffer from performance. And uh, better if you not only not suffer from performance, but just because of these abstractions are being selected so nicely, then you actually get more performance than if you would use a traditional programming model. 
Um, yeah, so I think high level program abstractions are, are needed. Next gen compilers kind of uh, things uh, need to be devised. And this includes uh, understanding the computational and cost models of these emerging accelerators. And that's something that I'll be talking about. These emerging accelerators I'll be talking about kind of in the, the second half of this talk. Okay, so that's kind of the, the motivation for some of the research that we do. Um, so let me give a little bit more concrete motivation. So, so for the why we need abstractions. So this is a, an interpolation kernel, which uses some, this is kind of a tensor expression for the interpolation. And if you go, and, and I guess nobody here would go and write code that looks like this, but if you go and write it directly as, uh, as this naive um, loop program, um, and you pass it to the compiler, so some of you would back from the compilers would know that, yeah, the compiler looks at a control data flow graph that looks some, some, somewhat like this. It's actually, uh, the, the control data flow graph for this piece of code, which has been already a bit simplified so that I can put it in the slide. Um, and if you pass it to the compiler, the compiler will have a really tough job um, determining or finding a lot of things that actually could be um, optimized in this code, right? And in fact, if you compare the result of the compiler for this piece of code uh, with the result of the compiler for this piece of code, which is implementing the same functionality, the, the, the difference in, in speed up is about 100x in a, in a, in a single threaded core and a multi-core. So there's a lot of performance to be gained if you, if you program this correct, right? And, and, and some of you may be thinking, yeah, how, how that could be possible? And the thing is, this is really, really stupidly written. Yeah, this is just to make a point, okay? Um, but the, the difficult thing is that now we, we we cannot make it from, from this abstraction, if you, if you brought it this inefficiently, it's very difficult to match it to a, a, a Intel CPU with the vector instructions and all these kind of things. But that's actually known and we've been working with those machines for a long time. Now, what happens if you, if you want or if you expect uh, a compiler to bring this down to a, like a TPU kind of system or a in-memory accelerator based on memory source or into a, uh, one of those Alveo Silings boards with with HVM, so it's 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 very difficult to expect that if we cannot make it for an Intel CPU that we know so well uh, that we can make it for this new kind of thing. So that's why I think we we need um, um, to close the semantic gap to uh, bring more high level abstractions to to programs. And so that's um, that's something that is not just me. So you you see, there's a lot of also work on on compilers, polyglot compilers, trace driven parallel uh, parallelization. Uh, pattern recognition, idiom extraction. I think all these kind of things are really important as well. So not only DSLs are, are needed, but all, all these kind of things are important as well so that you are able to recognize those patterns in, in legacy code that we have around. And I stole this picture from a paper that I, that I liked uh, from CGO last year, where you see, right, so you have this, these people trying to raise the abstraction. I think there's a lot of value in that. Uh, the other option is that you start uh, at the top with, with a domain-specific language or a domain-specific library. It doesn't have to be a la language, right? It just has to be an abstraction that could be offered via a language like you have in, in many machine learning frameworks. Um, and so that's, uh, that's very important also to, to help domain experts write uh, efficient code. And so there's a lot of examples, and, and I guess many of you would know some of these, like, hey, I just find out from Marcus Puget over there in at ETH. So this, there's a lot of um, ex, um, very successful kind of um, DSLs that have demonstrated that it is possible to actually beat a manually written code. Okay, so let, let me show some examples of some of the DSLs that we that we have been working on in, in my group. Uh, so these DSLs, some of them are still kind of toy examples, but just to, to make a point and, and to show that we can do uh, interesting stuff. So let me start with, with this one here, which is a DSL for particle mesh simulations. So here we collaborate with um, Ivo Salzarini and some people in, in computational biology. And so they are working on this particle model because they, they really like it because it's very flexible. You can model discrete, continuous, deterministic, and stochastic things. And so we were working with them, or we have been working with them for maybe six years now. Uh, and trying to refine language like with, with really the, the computation of biologists, what kind of things they would like to program. And um, so we came up with, with different syntaxes over the years. And, and this is something that is more or less up to date. So you see here is syntax for a problem that is, that is continuous. And, and here you see some syntax for a problem that is, um, that is discrete. So it's, it's very simple to, to write. You are not uh, writing um, very complex uh, loops. And, um, so one thing that you see here in, in the case of particle modeling, you always have this interact and evolve kind of kernels. 
And uh, here you just have to define them and the compiler will insert things like um, interpolation between going from a particle into a mesh or from a mesh into the particle, or you, we can insert the cost synchronization with other nodes and, and that kind of stuff. So this is uh, something that we've, we've been worked quite a bit. Um, Right. The other thing that we wanted to, to help uh, programmers uh, with this DSL is to, to make it easier to debug or maybe not even need it to debug. So before, and this is something that you, that you see very commonly, you, you, you see people trying to already introduce abstractions in their code what, what, by using the scriptings and, and stuff. And, and this is something that we had in this project at the beginning. So there were like Ruby scripts, Perl scripts, and, and many different things, but uh, it was very, uh, brittle, right? And, and then you, you write something in something that looks like a DSL, but then you get an error in, in from a Perl script or you get an error in the generated Fortran code. And, and that's something that they wanted to avoid. Now, uh, the collaborators have developed a library which is called OpenFPM, which is a C++, C++ library. And that already offers a lot of, a lot of um, abstractions via metaprogramming. So if you want to write this, this kind of differential operator or differential equation, you will have to code this, this kind of things in, in, in the C++ uh, templated library, which is already quite uh, way better than, than what there was before. But um, if, you, if you have worked with this kind of codes, you would recognize that it's, uh, there's a lot of copy paste uh, uh, danger here, right? Because you, you have these things for every dimension. And if you have two dimensional, four dimensions, you have the same thing. And then if you, if you just forget to replace an X by a C or by a Y, it's very difficult to, to debug or to get this, this code correct. So what we did is that we, we offer this, this abstraction and um, something that we think is very important is that the compiler does what we call uh, model to model transformation. So we have a model of the DSL and we have a model of the library. And so we actually map from one model to the other. We're not generating text, uh, but we're generating um, uh, syntax trees if, if you wish, right? So then if this is, if this is the actual expression for, for what you saw before, then we can map this down into our IR. And in this IR, we can then generate different ways uh, the code. And, and so at the end, it would look something, something like this and um, in, in the C++ uh, world. And um, we did some experiments to see how, how this works. And here you see a comparison in terms of, uh, of lines of code. And uh, so this comparison is, is, is actually leaving out that the lines of codes in the DSL are way simpler than the lines of code in, in heavily template, templatized C++ code. And we were showing that here we could actually, from the abstract representation, we, we were able in this case and in this case to more or less match the performance of the handwritten code. Uh, here, the handwritten code is in, is in uh, orange or yellow. Um, in the middle, we actually were not able to match the performance, but this is, we, we realized why, why that was. So we were, we were generating loops um, in an, an unfused version, in an unfused way, and some of those loops could be fused. And that's something that we, we realized later that we, we can do that, right? But um, it's, it's not a fundamental issue of, of the model that we selected. And the reason why we selected these three use cases is because it, it kind of shows this different kind of simulations that you can run, right? Some uh, pure particle-based simulation, a, a pure mesh simulation. And the, the, the third one, which was the more, more challenging one, is where you actually have uh, particles and meshes at the same time in the, in the simulation. So something that I'm not gonna talk about, uh, about here is something that we, that we did also with this language, because now since we know what kind of, op what, what kind of operators we have at our disposal to discretize uh, continuous simulations. So we did some auto-tuning of the, of the discretization approach with parameters and so on. And that was published last year in, or this year in the Journal of Computational Science. Okay, oh, this is what I said. Okay, the second example, uh, I need to check if yeah, time-wise I'm doing okay. The second example is uh, tensor expressions. That's, ex that's what I actually showed you before in the, in the motivation for abstractions. Um, so this is an, an, a, a language that we started developing with people doing computational fluid dynamics. And that was a little bit before uh, TensorFlow and this kind of um, tensor abstractions for machine learning. So in the end, we also show that those abstractions could be used for, for tensor expressions in machine learning. Um, this thing here is the interpolation current that I, that I mentioned before. And in, and in this DSL, we have different syntaxes. So this is kind of one that integrates into the forefront code that the people were using uh, for computational fluid simulations. And this is kind of a C++ embedding that offers kind of the same um, abstraction. Uh, so here you see that 
this, this is like a like a one-to-one -one representation of these things. So the only extra stuff that you see here is that you have some indexes to tell the compiler which dimensions of the tensors are contracted, which which with which. Okay. Good. So um, yeah. So so the code that I showed you before, which is this one here, is actually automatically generated by the by the compiler. And uh, I don't have the plots here, but yeah, with, with this, with this, with very simple heuristics, we were able to generate code that actually matched the code that was maintained by the people running those simulated simulations. So it was a kind of a happy uh, story there. We, we actually, in some cases, for some polynomial degrees, for some some uh, some different param parameters of the of the algorithm of the numerical algorithm, uh, we were able to kind of uh, beat the performance of manually written code in Fortran. And actually, we um, the, the people were, that were maintaining the code, they realized, oh, yeah, we, we can do that as well. And then so they afterwards, they, they improved their code as well, kind of inspired by the code that we were generating. Um, yeah, so so the, and the reason why we can do that for input processes is that we can, we can do some um, algebraic transformations uh, so that, that are actually quite simple at this level. And that, that's kind of the point of these abstractions. Um, so yeah, so from, from, from this um, abstraction, we can generate very, very varied kind of graphs. So what you see here is again, uh, actual control data flow graphs for the same expression. And these data flow graphs are even compressed a little bit further than the graph that I showed before. And it's very easy to generate this fundamentally different control flows, as, as you can see. So these graphs are very, are very, very different in their structure. They are easy to generate, but hard to transform. And that's kind of the whole point, right? Um, if you think about the traditional compiler, what you're asking the traditional compiler to do is to uh, turn a graph that looks like this into a graph that looks like that, maybe, right? Or, or the other way around, right? depending on which one works better. And if you have a, any experience with compilers, you know how difficult it is to do something like this, right? Because this involves a lot of real control transformations, a lot of global analysis, uh, and this kind of stuff. So we, we then went on and, and kind of uh, formalize some transformations and some rewrites in, in a, like a, what we call the cross-domain tensor uh, optimization uh, framework. Uh, this was work uh, with Albert Cohen. And um, this was back in 2018. And, and so we, we wanted to see, can we do better than Pluto? So in some cases, so some of you may know Pluto, that's kind of a state-of-the-art polyhedral compiler. In some cases, we, we were able to do better than Pluto because these codes are actually if you, if you have all the parameters fixed, which sometimes you don't, but if you have all the parameters fixed, um, this, this, this code is very easy to, or is very amenable to polyhedral compilers. So here you see that um, in some cases, we were able to, to beat uh, the polyhedral compiler. In some other cases, like for instance, uh, here and here, uh, the polyhedral compiler was still a little bit better than ours, um, but we could actually lock the transformation that the polyhedral compiler did, and we could uh, also do them in our, abstraction, which again shows that it's not a fundamental problem, it's just an engineering problem to get those things going. And, and back then, a student tried to write some of these kernels in TensorFlow, and you see that back then, um, maybe granted, it was an earlier version of TensorFlow, and we didn't play with all the, all the flags, but you see that um, back then, we, we so that the performance that you would obtain from TensorFlow was not very uh, amazing. But more importantly for us is that you, you couldn't write things like the Helmholtz operator for, for tensor expressions in, in, in TensorFlow because of fundamental issues of the abstractions shows in TensorFlow, which is which is natural, right? That those are written for machine learning. Okay, so so today uh, we are um, extending this kind of uh, small language, this toy language, and we moved our compiling infrastructure into MLIR. I was talking to Nikolai before about MLIR. So we are adopting MLIR because we think um, the community is growing, and I think many of the things that we're doing ad hoc, kind of in our homegrown abstractions, we can actually reuse a bunch of things, right? We could, we, we're doing kind of polyhedral analysis, uh, we, we're doing uh, linear algebra transformations. So now we can maybe map them down to this linear algebra dialect in NMLIR. Um, we also formalized an intermediate language for tensors that we call tensor intermediate language, TAIL. Uh, and this language we actually uh, or a postdoc of mine, Norman Ring, he demonstrated that, um, or he proved that in this, um, if, if you can map expressions down to that, down to that intermediate language for tensors, uh, then you are guaranteed not to get um, things like out of, out of access buffers. I mean, you're guaranteed not to get segmentation faults, basically. And I think that's also very important, especially uh, for safety critical applications, you don't want or you don't want the code to go wrong, right? So, so, so it's something about safety that we that we can also achieve with these DSLs and abstractions. 
Um, yeah, so, so today we are not only, of course, generating for, for Intel CPUs, but also for Alveo platforms. And I'm gonna show you some results um, in a minute. And so the nice thing about, the, about working in MLIR is that now we can formalize those transformations that we were doing into canonicalizations in MLIR, right? For instance, here you see uh, some uh, tile operations that we have in our DSL. They, they correspond almost one-to-one -to, -one to what uh, the DSL is able to express. And uh, actually today we have a very nice um, round tripping. So you could actually go from the DSL into the, into the first MLIR dialect, do some transformations, algebraic transformations there, and then export them as DSL again. So that kind of the, uh, the domain expert can see that everything is, is, is still fine. Yeah, so here you see some kind of canonicalizations. A contraction can be transformed into a diagonalization and a reduction. A, a sequence of products and a reduction can be um, factorized into, into this sequence of operations. Or um, here, um, product, diagonal, and reduction could be mapped. And as you see here, this could be mapped directly into the lower lineal uh, tensor reshape and matrix multiplication, right? The ones that we all know from, from, um, from lean algebra and very important for, for um, machine learning, okay? So these kind of transformations can be then automated uh, with, or we have automated them in, in, in the MLIR kind of uh, program stack. Okay, so this, this is what, what I'm talking about now, this, this, all this, this work into MLIR and converging abstractions is something that we're doing in the context of the Everest uh, European project. Um, so last year uh, we were, so we were interested in looking into, can we execute some of these like classical HPC workloads, right? This is uh, numerical kernels for spectral element, element methods in CFD. Can we execute them on FPGAs? And, and at the beginning, most of us thought, yeah, this is a nice experiment, but that's not gonna work so well because uh, we, we need uh, a high precision. Um, these things may be memory bound and so on. But anyway, we, we wanted to, to see how we can perform. So. The nice thing is that from our, from our DSL, it was very easy to have a very abstract representation of how we use buffers. So here is kind of the expression. These are tensors, S, D, U, and V. Uh, and these are temporary tensors, um, R, T, T1, T0, T3. And what you see here with edges are a very coarse grained representation of what kind of buffers are used when. And so in this collaboration, we worked with Christian Pilato at Politecnico di Milano because he has a tool that can understand this kind of uh, information about buffers to create custom memory architectures on FPGAs. So with, fr from this representation and our DSL, we can then generate kind of memory managers in, in, in the FPGA, uh, especially to reuse buffers so that we can reuse temporary, uh, temporary space in, in, in the FPGA. And we, in, in the first experiments, this was not very awesome. So we were working on a, on a small uh, silent sync uh, platform uh, so here our reference is not very strong. This is just code running on the arm that lives in that same port. Um, and uh, we show that now we can replicate multiple times the kernel and, and get uh, and get a speed up, which is kind of expected. Uh, more interesting though is, is this aspect of, can we, can we gain anything by transforming the code so that we can reuse space more efficiently? And so here, for instance, what you see is that, um, for instance, this design, which means that we have 16, kernels on the FPGA wouldn't fit in the FPGA uh, if we were not cleverly reusing space. Uh, whereas here, uh, reusing space, we could, we could fit that one. So this is something that we published last year. Uh, more recently, we were then saying, okay, now we, we, we are able to target into CPUs, we're able to target like classical bus attached FPGAs like in the same board. And uh, we went uh, and looked into the, into the Alveo card with uh, high bandwidth memory. And of course, so this is another beast. So this is a larger FPGA with um, a lot of channels with a high throughput to access data. Um, and to our surprise, we actually did, did quite good. So there's a lot of optimization that we, that we have to do. This is again, a collaboration with Christian Pilato at Politecnico di Milano. And some of those, some of these transformations are hand coded. So not, we're not doing yet everything automatically, but there, nothing prevents us from doing that it's, as I said, engineering. And um, you see that there's a sequence. So if you start with the baseline and this is kind of the performance that you get in the, in the intro processor, 16 gigaflops. And if you start with this baseline and you start doing a sequence of optimizations uh, uh, to some point you get to a performance of 40, 40 something gigaflops. Here you see two bars because the first bar is the, the, the 
kernel alone in the FPGA, and the second bar is the kernel in the system, right? With with the actual moving the data, uh, like in the communication with the with the host, right? And see, here you see that this is actually still quite compute bound. We're not uh, suffering any any delays. Only here, when when we when we switch, we we, we switch to to fixed point. Uh, we see that uh, the system performance is is yeah, I mean, what five percent lower than the than the performance of the kernel alone. And this is just for one kernel. Um, we then did a kind of a efficiency kind of analysis, which you see in this plot. Uh, different configurations. Um, here we are. Uh, before we were just playing with one kind of kernel with a polynomial degree of eleven. Now here we have different polynomial degrees. Uh, that's the p here. Uh, you have different kind of amount of um, kernels, kernel replication that you do on the FPGA fabric, and the plot here shows you the the power on the on the, the left hand side and the efficiency in terms of um, yeah gops per watt because these are not all floating point operations. And there you see that the the efficiency can be really really high, right? It could reach um, something like like here 3.9 compared to 0.16, right? So there's a lot of uh, potential here and actually more than we than we expected so this is something that we are uh, continuing and, and and so the within the everest project we are collaborating with people doing uh, weather models in, in italy in shima and so they are uh, there are some kernels there that are also expressible with tensors that we're looking into and also in the embedding with with, um, with their um, portal code they are using wrf so the wrf um, um, frame, framework for for weather modeling Okay, so that's those are the two examples of DSLs and what we are doing with these DSLs. So let, let me change gear here a little bit and talk about uh, these emerging memory technologies that I mentioned before. Um, maybe some of you are familiar with with these things. Um, so let me let me go quickly over two uh, particular emerging technologies that we're working with. Um, I guess the concept of in-memory computing is, is known to most of you, right? The idea of in-memory computing is very appealing, right? The idea is that you don't have to bring the data through all the cache hierarchy into the into the data path of the processor to do some computation. What you do is that you do computation where the data resides. And um, in PCM, for instance, um, PCM stands for phase change memory. You can do that, right? You store data as, as weights, uh, you store data as, as analog values in what are called like memristors. And so the nice thing is that then if, you, if, the, if the weights of your neural network, if you wish, are stored in these devices, then by putting the input into these lines as analog voltages, what you get in the end is an addition of the weighted sum, which is in the end a dot product, right? So here you can do um, a matrix matrix multiplication in constant time. And so this is a this is a figure from a paper from uh, Abu Sebastian in IBM Zurich, um, and which is very promising. They have some product where they can demonstrate that with I think five hundred thousand devices or so. Um, a little bit more exotic even are so-called racetrack memories, and this is something that actually we had a paper with Dawson um, two years ago, um, Dawson Hofla. Um, so racetrack memories are a emerging memory technology where you have silicon nanowires, uh, not silicon nanowires, you have nanowires, magnetic nanowires, and in these nanowires, you can store sequences of bits serially, okay? So the nice thing about that is that then you can have a very, very densely packed uh, memory. So you can have maybe the DRAM capacity in an SRAM form factor with SRAM kind of latency characteristics while being non volatile So it's a very interesting memory technology. Um, and not only that, but people have been working on ways to use those uh, those mag magnetic effects um, to do also in in memory computing with with these devices okay so there's a lot of work in this in this area and to me what is interesting is to understand what are those primitives that this in memory um, devices support like for instance in pcm we we understand dot products and matrix matrix multiplication quite good but there are also some non-linearity in those devices that could actually maybe be applied to apply uh, to, to implement some of the non-linear functions in stuff, for instance, in in, a, in the activation of a neuron. Um, in RTM, it's a bit less understood. There is a lot of stuff that points at we can do both logic with majority operations, we can do efficient counting and, and other kind of stuff. And there are many other technologies, like for instance, for electric FETs, where you can implement very efficiently content content addressable memories which offers primitives for machine learning algorithms that are maybe not the traditional ones, maybe one-shot learning, hyper-dimensional computing, and, and the like. 
So there's a lot of interesting um, interesting things going on with this with these devices um, that we are looking into. Uh, as an example, we work here, and this is a collaboration with uh, Hen Corporal in Eindhoven and Tobias Grossa. Um, so where we use MLIR actually to show that we can transparently something that is written back then in tensor comprehensions, um, which is a machine learning framework from, from Facebook back then. So we could actually pass it into a MLIR compilation stack uh, with some default dialects like Linux and standard control um, and standard. And we inserted kind of um, a new dialect to represent what you can do in memory. So SIN stands for uh, computation in memory. Um, and we showed here that yes, you can then lower these things into the into the accelerator. And so transparently in a, in a code that is written in maybe in Python, uh, you can actually uh, transparently target a system with a CPU and a memory stiff accelerator. That's kind of what, what, I, what I described at the beginning. How, how are we expecting a compiler to do that from C? So now we, we're not doing that from C, we're doing that from a higher level abstraction, in this case, um, um, like a tensor, again, like a tensor abstraction. Um, so of course this, so there's a lot of, so there are papers already like, like the paper Puma is, is a very well-known paper. There are papers that show that the efficiency or the potential efficiency of these devices is, raised, is really off the shots, right? If you want to do matrix matrix multiplication, if you want, just want to do convolutions and feed forward networks, um, the efficiency is, is of two or three orders of magnitude compared to execution on a CPU. What we wanted to look into here is not only just just map the machine learning workload, but also can we also, as we did before, can we also use this for like cross-domain tensor expressions? And, and so this is what we got. So here you see, uh, again, the, the baseline here is maybe not super strong. This is a, a baseline is an ARM, um, an ARM core. But anyway, the difference are so big that it's maybe uh, irrelevant. And so here we, we're just uh, going through uh, multiple different uh, benchmarks and realizing what kind of transformations we could do, right? So here we're tiling, of course, we have to tile those loops into so that they fit the crossbar array uh, in the memory, um, parallelization and uh, interchanging loops to improve the, the lifetime of these devices. So there's another aspect of this of these devices that if you, if you write them very often, they die. So if you want to do compiler optimizations to avoid that happening. So that's, uh, for instance, in this case, it was just interchange. Um, and what you, what you see here is that the performance uh, goes down. And in, in some cases, like the easy cases, uh, much more, do you see the, the difference in, in performance is huge, right? Um, in other cases, like for instance, LSTM. So LSTM is not very heavy on Matmult kind of uh, kernels. And that's why, uh, so the compiler is not able to use the accelerator so, so nicely. So that's why you, you have here at the beginning, a, a, a quite a slowdown. But in the end with optimizations, we, we managed to get some performance out of that, okay? Um, so this is the plot for performance, and this is the plot for energy consumption for those benchmarks. And here you see again a bunch of bars going down. So you have um, performance of an order, or um, performing uh, sorry efficiency of one or two orders of magnitude. So in 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 total, you get a lot of uh, a lot of benefits from this kind of technology. So that's why um, we, among many others, are kind of excited with this with this with the possibilities that these uh, new devices offer. Okay, so I'm a little bit running uh, behind schedule. So I think I, I have been 30 and 40 minutes, so I'm still, still kind of okay. So let's um, maybe move on a little bit with this with this racetrack memory. So I said before that um, a cell in a racetrack memory, like a cell in a DRAM is a, is a, is a capacitor. A cell in SRAM is, is a bunch of transistors that store a bit. A cell here is a, na a magnetic nanowire that's, that maybe store 100 bits. Right, and if you want to read one of those bits, you have to shift those bits to the head so they can read those bits. It's like a tape, right? Every cell is kind of a tape, and um, and so it will take you time to shift those bits through the tape if you want to access, for instance, if you if your if your tape at, is at position ten and you want to access bit hundred, you will have to wait for potentially for uh, ninety cycles to get access to that to that value. So that's very challenging, and so we've been working on how to um, work against those or how to ameliorate the impact of those uh, shifts by um, instruction placement, data placement, and so on and so forth. So that it, we've, we've produced um, a, a couple of papers uh, dealing with these, these things. Now back to tensors. 
so tensors was a was a nice um, story here because uh, the the way you do matrix matrix multiplication right, or, or tensor contractions right you can transform them so that you can map them to a matmult kind of uh, primitive um, the way you do that is that you if you if you think about tile uh, this is a tile operation of uh, for matrix matrix multiplication you would get a right uh, like the row with the column and again the row with the column and what you see here is that the, the second time you want to access this row you basically have to rewind the tape to access this element over here. So what we find out, what we found out is that this could be um, optimized greatly by kind of walking these tensors in a zigzag manner. So you don't have to rewind and start from the beginning, but you can start at the end and then now do the multiplication in reverse order, so to speak, right? So you, the first time you, you operate on this row, you go in that way. The second time you operate on this row, you go in the opposite direction. So that's something that, that we actually um, generalized into compilers using polyhedral compilers. So we generalize this, these transformations of, of data layout in the memory and also the way you, you walk through those, uh, through those values also for genetic um, stencils. And this is the work that I mentioned before that was done in collaboration with actually your group, with, with the group of um, uh, Thompson Herflow. And um, also Tobias was, uh, was in this group back then. So we showed that this actually worked. And, and so here you have a bunch of kernels and um, here is the, the amount of shifts and the performance would follow something similar. And then, so this plot is a little bit hard to read because there are multiple different versions. So uh, what, what, you, what you see here is for instance, uh, the, the performance of ISL alone or ISL with our like racetrack specific um, optimizations. And usually these two are the ones that performs better. And very often they perform much, much better than um, and if you if you wouldn't do anything to, to cope with with the uh, with the shifting problem of, of racetrack memories, but I mentioned before that people are looking into how to do in-memory computing with racetrack memories, and so there is um, a work that that uh, with some collaborators and this is Alex uh, Jones in Pittsburgh, and so they can they demonstrated that they can actually pass currents not to shift, right? Because usually you, you pass the current through the nanowire to move those, to move the tape, right? But uh, if they pass a current that is smaller than the one that you use to shift, you can actually uh, kind of count the number of ones, which is a very interesting primitive, right? And what can you do with that? And together with their group, we, we started doing like a, like a hand design for hyperdimensional computing, um, which we again expect to be able to generalize into, into something that compilers can target. And that's a project that we're working uh, right now on. So for those of you that are not familiar with hyperdimensional computing, this is kind of a different way of, of yeah, it's a different machine learning algorithm. And the idea, the idea here is that um, instead of using 32 bits to represent data or 64 bits to represent data, you go into, into really high dimensions, right? And you, instead of this 64 bits, you have 10,000 bits. And once you have those 10,000 bits and you have to, you have to make sure that there are some statistic properties of, of the ones and the zeros in, in, those, in those bits, um, you can actually do a very quick learning of stuff. And then so training becomes uh, simpler because things are more separable. And uh, so there's a, bunch of, there's a bunch of ways to do hyperdimensional computing, but in principle, it works like this. So you have, so you encode the item, for instance, if you want to recognize um, if, 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 a, if a text is from a given language, and you encode this, this, the, the characters into this hyperdimensional space, and you start learning. And this, most of the operations are very simple here. So you do some, um, as, you, as you see here, you do some uh, XORing, you do some shifting, and, and so on. And then at the end, you do some addition. And at the end, you do a population count, which is counting once. And that's why we looked into this for how can we do all of this in, in memory. And there's been already algorithms, uh, also, I think, from Abu Sebastian in IBM. That, that do this in, in PCM, not entirely in PCM, so they have to do something on, on CMOS. Um, and we showed that we could actually do everything in RTM in, in, a, in a very efficient uh, way with, with this kind of a new in-memory computing primitive that RTMs um, have. Good results, I'm not gonna maybe go through this because results, they, they are really good. As you can imagine, I mean, if, if, you have, if you have to do processing in, 10, in 10K bits, FPGA designs already are way, way more efficient than CPUs or, or, or GPUs. There are papers showing that because it's very difficult to do all those, all, all those um, bit alignment and all these kind of things. So that's why FPGA is a, is a very strong baseline here. 
and we show that this this thing uh, improves performance and energy efficient uh, by quite a bunch uh, compared to the RTM uh, to the to the FPGA design. Okay, so let me go to the summary. So what have I talked about today? So yeah, so I talked about uh, the case for raising the level of abstraction. I think that's uh, that's mostly understood. I, I don't think I'm the only one um, talking about these kind of things. Um, I do think that uh, working classical compiler is still very relevant, like for instance, understanding kernels, understanding uh, patterns in existing code. Um, also kind of HLS tools, so we are not replacing HLS tools. We are massaging the code so that we can actually get the best performance of HLS tools and maybe, maybe um, down the line, uh, insert new kinds of pragmas, perhaps. Uh, I showed you some DSL examples, um, not only for productivity, but also for efficiency of the execution. And, uh, and how we are kind of using these high level semantics to target accelerators and, and, and complex systems um, as a whole. So moving forward, so we are working on this convergence with MLIR. Um, we, we, have, um, we have found some, some, some problems with, with the MLI infrastructure, but actually we're kind of happy uh, with, with, how, with how this is going or where this is going. Um, I am very interested in, in having a generalizing compilers over different in-memory computing primitives, kind of an, an instruction set architecture, if you wish, for in-memory computing. That's something that uh, I think will be very important moving forward. Um, and so we have done connection with like kind of the Fortran code bases for computation fluid dynamics. And we're doing that also for the WARF uh, weather simulation. But I think there is a lot of work to be done to, to, to get the plumbing right so that domain experts can really use these things in a, in a productive in a productive way. And I'm using this abstraction here because I think that's, a, right, that's the hourglass model where you have kind of a very thin abstraction so that people working up here do not have to really care about the, 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 the complexities down here in the hardware. Um, maybe with MLIR, uh, and I was trying to do that, maybe with MLIR you have a, a sequence of hourglasses. I was trying to do that in a graphic, but it was too ugly. That's why I left um, this one over here. Okay, uh, so with that, um, let me thank uh, all the, the people here. These are the people in my group and also uh, some of the collaborators which are mentioned by name and I hope most of the times in these slides. And I'd like to thank everybody for the attention and I'm looking forward to uh, as answering your questions if I can. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, so thank you very much, Geronimo. Before we move to questions, just a quick advertisement. Our next SPCL BCAST seminar will be on the 5th of May, uh, again at 9 a.m. Zurich times, the same time slot. And we will have Mohammed Wahib of the Rikin Center for Computational Science discussing the, some of the challenges of scaling deep learning on high performance computing systems.